Hello, and welcome to our webcast. This webcast, titled An Introduction to the Campbell Collaboration, Aims, Achievements, and Ambitions, is the first in a series of webcasts that focus on the International Campbell Collaboration, often referred to as C2. This first webcast will orient you to the purpose and major functions of C2 and the benefits that it strives to produce. We plan to bring you more webcasts on a monthly basis focusing on C2 groups and resources and ways that you can get involved. So keep looking for these. This webcast is supported by the SEDL Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research that is funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. SEDL is a private nonprofit organization located in Austin, Texas. I am John Westbrook, Program Manager of the SEDL Disability Research to Practice Program and co-chair of the C2 Coordinating Group on Knowledge Translation and Implementation. We are very happy to have today's speakers with us. They are the following folks. Dr. Julia Littell is co-chair of the C2 Steering Committee and professor at the Graduate School of Social Work and Social Research at Bryn Mawr College. Dr. Amon Noonan is Chief Executive Officer of the Campbell Collaboration. And Dr. Sean Grant is the former managing editor of the C2 Education Coordinating Group and has been uh, newly hired to be the Associate Behavioral and Social Scientist at the RAND Corporation. Welcome to all of you. Thank you all very, very much for being here. I will now turn it over to Sean. Take it away, Sean. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction and for having us here today. Uh, I am briefly going to overview what this talk will be on. First, we will discuss why is there a Campbell collaboration and who is involved in this collaboration. Next, we want to explain to all the listeners out there what do we do and what we have achieved so far. Uh, then we want to address what will be coming next. What does the future of the collaboration hold? Followed by some frequently asked questions that we often received in emails, at the colloquium, and so forth. So the first question I would like to pose is, why is there a Campbell Collaboration? Hi, everyone. This is Julia Littell. Um, the Campbell Collaboration exists to provide a world library that contains the most comprehensive, reliable summaries of empirical evidence that can inform social policy and practice. And our aim, ultimately, is to improve human lives. We work in the fields of education, social welfare, crime and justice, and international development. The Campbell Collaboration produces and disseminates comprehensive, rigorous analyses and syntheses of research results. These summaries are called systematic reviews. We were inspired by the work of Donald T. Campbell, an American sociologist, who said that the United States and other modern nations should be ready for an experimental approach to social reform, an approach in which we try out new programs designed to address specific problems, in which we learn whether or not these programs are effective, and in which we retain, imitate, modify, or discard programs based on the, on the basis of their effectiveness on the multiple imperfect criteria available. Although Donald Campbell uh, made the case for systematic, rigorous evaluations of policy and programs more than 40 years ago, at present, less than $1 out of every $100 of government spending is actually backed by the most basic evidence that the money is being spent wisely. We know that social and health interventions have the potential to do harm as well as good. So um, research evidence is needed to guide effective policy and practice in order to improve our health and mental health, human development across the lifespan, to reduce child abuse and neglect, 
interpersonal violence, crime and justice, to improve education, community and economic development, and ensure economic stability and equity. The advantage of a stronger knowledge base uh, is several. For the individual client, we should expect better services through better decisions. For the practitioner, we aim to produce easier access to reliable and up-to-date information as a supplement to professional judgment. For policymakers, a better knowledge base can inform policy decisions. For paymasters, better evidence can lead to more effective allocation of resources. And for society as a whole, we aim to produce better outcomes, improving the quality of human life. Who's involved in the Campbell Collaboration? Well, Campbell has involved thousands of people from all continents in the world. The uh, people involved in the Campbell Collaboration represent a wide range of disciplines, interests, and skills. About 800 people have participated as systematic review authors. 150 have served as peer reviewers. We have teams of editors, trainers, advisory boards. Um, John mentioned our international steering group. And many people have presented at colloquia and other Campbell meetings. The international steering group for the Campbell collaboration is made up of 16 people. Uh, these are the members as of May uh, 2014. Steering group members are elected representatives of various Campbell uh, coordinating groups and working groups. Our international collaboration has unique strengths. We harness the potential of dispersed and diverse expertise, getting the right blend of competencies, both substantive, practical, and methodological knowledge and skills to inform our work. This allows us to operate with a very light infrastructure and more effective allocation of resources and division of labor can help us build a more complete evidence base. Now I'll turn this to our CEO, Eamon Noonan. Thank you, Julia. Uh, what do we do and what have we achieved so far? The way to, you know, we start with great ideals and large ambitions of trying to improve the world and to improve the lives of people in it, particularly the vulnerable or people at risk. So this is a large goal and we need to work through it from where we are, each in our own desk or office or, or employment. The way we try to mediate going from large ambitious goals to uh, making and encouraging change it starts by articulating a strategy to do this. And we have uh, adopted a strategy that has four components or areas of which the first is to produce systematic reviews because there is such a need for filling in that knowledge gap that we find in many areas. The second area of activity is to disseminate the review so that the findings become available and can be taken account of in decision making on policy and practice. A third chapter or area of our strategy is to run a regular colloquium as a meeting place, a place to exchange ideas, to critique each other's work, and to engage, kind of build barriers between research people, policy people, practitioners. And then a fourth area in our strategy is simply that we run our network efficiently openly and democratically. So these are the areas that we try to work on and uh, we can report a certain amount of progress in different areas. It's a constant challenge, uh, but let's look at um, a few examples of reviews that have made an impact. The, one of the very first Campbell reviews is, addresses the Scared Straight program, which is a corrections program aimed at juvenile first offenders. Uh, this review was authored by Anthony Petrosino and colleagues about 10 years ago, slightly more than 10 years ago now. It was actually published before the Campbell Collaboration had uh, its own editorial infrastructure and was co-published or published by the Cochrane Collaboration, an, or an organization with which we continue to have very close and cordial links. This review corrected uh, the impression that these programs were effective 
the finding of a rigorous examination of the available evidence was that the program didn't deter people uh, from returning to crime and reoffending. People involved in this program were actually more likely to reoffend than comparable groups not in the program. So you had an intervention funded and operated in the corrections uh, systems that was actually creating more problems down the road, whereas uh, the intention was to help people find a way out of crime. The significance of this particular review was that it attracted a lot of attention and it led to decisions to back away from this program. Uh, it, the fusion uh, to other countries was, was reversed and it became an interesting, uh, it became a very well-known case. As you see on the slide here, we have uh, uh, the COPS office, a part of the Department of Justice of America, uh, reproduced the review and assured its dissemination widely in the correction services and related circles in the US. Uh, we also see that uh, in the UK, the Cabinet Office has only last year taken this review again as an example of uh, the need for a systematic reviewing of research evidence. Another uh, indication on this slide is uh, how contemporary it still is, an article from The Atlantic last summer, which talks about this review as, again, a reason to look closely and interrogate evidence very closely. We're very proud of this particular review, one of the very first. A more recent one uh, we published is on school-based programs against, uh, to reduce bullying and victimization by David Farringdon and Maria Tuffy of Cambridge University, the UK, uh, which has gotten quite considerable attention in different media. It's been referenced in Time magazine. Uh, just a few months ago, Huffington Post referred to it. The Center for Disease Control in Atlanta elaborated a fact sheet presenting the findings of this review. And the influential uh, newsletter on the criminology uh, side has also uh, summarized its uh, findings. So here's a review that has been disseminated widely, paid attention to, and its findings are helping to guide people, make decisions about whether to adopt bullying programs in schools, which kind of programs uh, are effective, and therefore to combat this very uh, universal problem of school bullying in the schoolyard, a problem that seems to affect almost every country uh, and continues year after year. So these individual reviews are examples of Campbell reviews that have made an impact and have been uh, widely disseminated. The core activity then in the strategy is to produce reviews, and I'm happy to say that we've stepped up review production, particularly in the past five, six years. We've really gotten a sense of momentum building. Our library of reviews has tripled in size since uh, 2008, and we are at the same time learning as we go along, learning how to do the practical job of delivering a review that little bit better. The importance of policy and guidelines for editors and policy and guidelines and standards for authors is very important. And I'm happy to say we've produced quite recently updated guidelines here that we can share with anyone involved in the process to encourage uh, a, a more successful flow of production. Uh, as a result of this growth that we've seen in the last few years, we can, we can report a large number of topics being addressed in the library. Here are just a few of them to prevent school dropout, how effective are mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, teachers' practices to manage disruptive students in classrooms, kinship care for people removed from the home, and the other subjects uh, mentioned on the slide. What we see is that any individual review is on a subject, maybe on a subject of such importance that it is in itself a valid contribution and a way to address uh, very serious social problems in a rigorous and scientific manner. We're trying to do the science that allows people find effective remedies for these serious problems. I'll give you a, another slide which shows uh, a little bit of um, some of the topics we present and how we present them a little bit on our website. Trafficking people for sexual exploitation, a major issue. And we have published a review which finds, unfortunately, that a lot of the um, programs and a lot of the spending uh, to address this problem, we can't find evidence of effectiveness, that it, we don't know enough about what we're doing to improve this situation. Uh, the mindfulness case I just mentioned, the classroom management case, 
also here. So you will find on our website uh, access to these reports, a brief introduction, or the full version of the report in our library. Uh, by engaging in the production of reviews, we've also found that the chances of successfully completing a review project are greatly uh, enhanced when the team involved has the training uh, in the methods of doing research synthesis. And this has led us to focus very strongly on confidence building and utilizing the expertise of the people in the network. Uh, we try to share this and uh, help encourage the building of confidence internationally. So we've run training workshops. Uh, we've run them in, I think, five continents by now. And we include them as a regular component of the annual colloquium. We also make uh, training videos available for free online and on our, our website, both on advanced methods and introductory research synthesis methods. We also are developing resources both for authors and indeed for policymakers and decision makers and practitioners uh, on our website in an area called the Resource Center. This is a start, and there's a lot of room to improve this, but these are things we have developed uh, in the past few years. On the dissemination side, we are committed to open access. This has, uh, allows uh, anyone to access our material, to pull out the full report uh, as in electronic format. And we find that this allows a wide distribution. Uh, we emphasize the colloquium and include discussions of ongoing work and completed work in the, discussion in the colloquium programs. Our website is an important channel for uh, giving people access to what we do. We are engaging more with social media uh, as time goes by, as we get familiar with the new possibilities and new opportunities of social media. And I would also like to mention that we're uh, seeing a demand internationally for our material in languages other than English. We're about to see the publication of no fewer than 35 Campbell Reviews in Chinese. Uh, we will see the publication of Campbell Reviews, uh, selected reviews in Spanish and uh, summaries of reviews, summarizing the findings of reviews, are available in other languages, including Norwegian and Danish, for example. So the international interest in what we do is developing quite strongly. Uh, this slide shows uh, the most downloaded reviews. And the figures are corrected for multiple downloads. So these figures represent unique uh, sites. Uh, so even if it's you know, one university, that means one download, even if many people at that university have uh, downloaded the review. The figures here, in that context, we think are quite good. Uh, not many research reports uh, get 25,000 readings. And it's in, helped by the fact that it's open access plainly. I see that uh, uh, we have a new number one on this table, because up until quite recently, the bullying program was our most downloaded review. I now see that the classroom management program has overtaken it in the number of downloads. And something like 15% of our uh, reviews are downloaded more than 5,000 times. The colloquia we've mentioned before, and that's been an important meeting point for us, for the network, and for people engaged in the creation of a better knowledge base for policy and practice. We've tended to go alternatively on either side of the Atlantic. Uh, so we do have a strong transatlantic uh, dimension. And we were most recently in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Uh, other venues are listed on this slide. We are a network in renewal to a large degree. In 2010, we created for the first time since the network was set up in 1999 a new group addressing international development issues. This actually enhanced our size and our global reach quite significantly. And it's been a very dynamic and innovative group, group since its beginning. We have recently reformed the group formerly known as User Group, which is now the Knowledge Translation and Implementation Group. And I'm very pleased to have John Westbrook and others involved in this to provide a new angle and a new impetus to our work. The leadership of Campbell is constantly renewing. We have term limits on our steering group. Uh, and that means that we have fresh blood and new uh, people coming in on a regular basis to share the expertise and help bring our common endeavor forward. 
And one of the most encouraging things to see uh, recently has been the emergence of a new generation of very, very uh, well uh, educated and very uh, dynamic uh, people with a strong grounding in statistical methods and other, way, other competences necessary for systematic uh, reviewing. And that's, to my mind, uh, one of the things that gives us confidence for the future of this network. And with that, I'd like to turn over to one of the people that fits that category, Sean. <laughs> Well, thank you, Eamon and Julia, for your overviews on the need for Campbell, who we are, uh, what we've done, and what we do. So now I'd like to briefly turn to what we're hoping to do moving forward. What does the future have in store for the Campbell collaboration? So as with any enterprise human effort, there is obviously room for improvement. We've accomplished quite a lot so far, but we want to continue to produce high-quality systematic reviews on important and pressing policy and practice topics. We want to, in doing that, continue to raise the profile of the collaboration and update perceptions on what Campbell does. We want to continue to improve the dissemination of the findings of these systematic reviews in partnership with knowledge translation and knowledge transfer organizations. And as Eamon noted, we have a newly named and newly re-energized knowledge, tra knowledge transfer and implementation group that will help to achieve that goal. And I think we also have a newly found interest in growing and energizing our network. I tend to think of Campbell as having two main arms, one being the production of systematic reviews, uh, and that would be through our editorial staff and our authors. And the second would be Campbell as an international network for those interested in research synthesis and its impact on policy across social and behavioral areas. So, in light of that, we want to keep the focus on this stronger knowledge base for policy and practice. That involves identifying and addressing what these knowledge gaps are and crossing the barriers between different sectors and disciplines. People may have different primary foci, but we actually have quite a lot in common across areas like education, social welfare, international development, crime and justice, ways to solve issues in these areas. A huge thing that we do is organizing knowledge. So for a common phrase is the information tsunami. We do live in an information age with plenty of research studies, news articles coming out every day. And we need to find a way to master and organize that knowledge and then accumulate and synthesize it so that we can continue to update our information and use that information in an effective, efficient way to influence policy and practice. We do that through our systematic reviews, and through these reviews, communicate to the policy and practice communities what we think should be done in important policy and practice areas. And not only is it important to develop systematic reviews outputs to achieve this end, but to have an active network where people meet at colloquia, where people continue conversations in between our in-person meetings to make sure that we stay up to date on the important knowledge gaps, on the important policy and practice issues, and the most rigorous methods for addressing those issues. So before we finish this uh, webcast, we wanted to go through a few frequently asked questions across all of these areas that we often get so we can give those of you out there listening and watching a uh, more in-depth and personal idea of what the Campbell Collaboration is and does. So one common question is, what is Campbell's unique selling point? I'm wondering, Eamon, would you mind addressing that? Uh, I'd be happy to. It's, uh, I have a number of um, candidates, but let, I, I'll go with one. I'll go with rigor, I have to say. that We will not publish a review until we're confident that it's been conducted uh, well, that it's been conducted in line with uh, the, the project plan, that the search has been systematic and reported uh, clearly, that the data has been analyzed in a, uh, in a way that corresponds to the most uh, advanced and best uh, statistical methods, and that the findings are very clearly and directly grounded in the results found in the review. Uh, if, we don't, if we're not satisfied with those requirements, we won't publish the review. That's not unique, but it's 
it's also the case that the phrase systematic review is very often, far too often, used for work and reports that are not quite systematic. Uh, so I would put that one as a candidate for our unique selling point. That's great. Thank you. And in addition to that, there are many organizations working in the evidence-based practice sphere. So where does Campbell exactly fit in, and how does it differ from other groups that are in this area? Julia, do you have any thoughts on this question? Sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, well, as Eamon said, there are uh, many organizations producing systematic reviews, and that term now means a lot of different things to different people. Um, what's uh, important about Campbell is that we aim to be the most reliable source of evidence in the fields of social care. So that means that Campbell systematic reviews differ from the reviews produced by uh, many other people in that we adhere to the um, latest evidence-based standards that are st established interna internationally across disciplines for conducting unbiased systematic reviews. We value um, accuracy, uh, that is we try to minimize error and bias at every step along the way in producing a systematic review. We value transparency so that readers should know how we uh, conduct our work and can um, critique that if, as needed. And we value access, again Eamon mentioned open access. So Campbell differs in that it um, is committed to the highest standards in producing reliable, credible evidence um, to inform practice and policy. Could I add to that, uh, Sean? It occurs another area where we differ perhaps from many organizations is that we operate in a national, in national context, certainly, but also internationally. This is an international uh, collaboration, and we see the benefit of that in that knowledge doesn't necessarily doesn't stop and shouldn't stop at a national frontier either on the way in or the way out and the uh, ability to draw on expertise and experience uh, from the US from different parts of the US from the UK from around Europe from Latin America Africa Asia is a strength we feel it helps us uh, avoid assumptions and get really to uh, effectiveness in ways that organizations operating in a national context uh, may find more difficult. So I would think the, the international dimension is quite important as well. It's a very good point. And I also, I'd say that um, it's important to mention that we are a nonpartisan group. Uh, we're not a political organization. We don't advocate for or against specific programs or policies. Our aim really is just to produce knowledge that's reliable so that others can act on it as, as they see fit in, a, in a concert with other concerns in their local or national contexts. Thank you both. Another common question uh, or comment that we often get is that too many reviews end up saying more research is needed. Do either of you have a response to this claim in light of what Campbell does and produces? Well, I, I do. Um, uh, sometimes that's true. I mean, sometimes when you answer one question or try to answer one question, that raises others. Um, so in some cases, we'll, a systematic review will find, as Eamon mentioned before, that the evidence available really isn't sufficient. So sometimes simply more research is needed. In other cases, it's not that more research is needed, but that a different kind of research, better research, research addressing the questions a little bit differently or um, from a different perspective is needed. But we also have reviews like the Scared Straight Review that Eamon talked about that pro provide pretty clear um, answers to a question and suggest that more research is, is not necessarily needed. So I think that when you look closely at our work, you'll find that there is a lot of nuance. Um, the, the advantage of a systematic review is that it really can highlight gaps in existing knowledge. Sometimes we find that important questions simply haven't been addressed by uh, current research. Thank you, Julia. How fast can one deliver a systematic review? 
What does it cost to do a review? And are there benefits to not going so fast in the production of a review? I can speak to that. Uh, it's a perennial question. Uh, we live in a society where the tempo is high, that we want uh, answers quickly, uh, and it's a challenge uh, to match research and research projects to a policy cycle, for example. So it's a very pertinent question. I think that uh, we can, if, if you want a genuinely systematic review done with good standards and involving the editorial back and forth that's essential to uh, achieve better quality, a phrase I like from Donald Campbell was that uh, organized distrust gives trustworthy reports. You have to uh, allow a back and forth between authors and editors, as well as all the stages involved in searching comprehensively for relevant literature, for screening large bodies of, of literature, for extracting data, summarizing, and writing up your report. These are steps that are important, and a process where you take out one or other of these elements compromises the accuracy of your final report. So. It's not a product that you can deliver in a month. Uh, and I would encourage people thinking of commissioning and funding systematic reviews to think of a year as uh, you know, a, a, a point at which, in the course of a year, one can progress from a, progress, uh, from a protocol, an agreed project plan, to the delivery of a report. But that also presumes that you're uh, working with a team that is not starting from scratch, knows what they're doing. It presumes that uh, you're uh, buying their time from the multiple other activities that academics, for example, are engaged in. So it's important to allow time uh, for a systematic review, and it's, there's good reasons not to rush the matter. On the cost question, it varies enormously. It varies depending on the amount of uh, time, the amount of studies, the breadth of the question, and so on. But it's fair to say that uh, if you conceive a systematic review as doing the science before you're about to commit large amounts of funding on a given program, it's fair to kind of link that to how much money you're going to be spending later. To get the best expertise to inform a decision on large funding commitments um, is worth an investment, whether that might be um, $100,000 or somewhat more or somewhat less, uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's almost a relative uh, figure. The important thing is that you're conducting a review on a genuinely, uh, on a question that can genuinely uh, inform decisions and gives us an opportunity to get the best outcomes and to choose the right strategies to deal with social problems that we encounter. Yeah, just that's an, I think a, an excellent answer. And just to add to the um, benefits of taking it slowly, a lot of some of the best studies um, in the fields of social care are not published. Um, these may be large government-funded um, program evaluations, and if you do a very quick review, you're likely to miss them. So <clears throat> it's been our experience that uh, quick reviews. Um, just sort of skim the top, uh, find the most accessible studies and not necessarily the best studies and not necessarily a comprehensive full view of the work that's been done. So by doing a careful comprehensive review, um, that produces different information than a quick and dirty uh, review. The other benefit of going more carefully is that you we can systematically try to minimize error and bias along the way. And there is plenty of evidence that it's very easy to make mistakes in systematic reviews. We're dealing with a lot of complex studies that report a lot of very um, technical information, and making sure that we've captured that accurately, um, thoughtfully, is not something that can be done quickly. So we often say that um, policymakers want answers that are quick, cheap, cheap, and accurate. But if we really care about accuracy, and I think we do, then um, it's, the answers are not likely to be come quickly or, or cheaply. Another point that's important to think about here is that the questions that are really important for policy and practice in the fields of social care and health care are not questions that go away this year or next year. 
if you look at the history of education, social welfare, criminology, um, you take a look and some of the most pressing questions have been asked decade after decade. Um, for instance, uh, what are the effects of providing incentives for teachers, of um, providing outcomes-based um, uh, re rewards? What are the benefits of home care versus foster care for children? These questions have been around for dozens uh, and sometimes a hundred years. Um, and they keep popping up because we have um, only partial answers. So by creating this world library that we can constantly update, we aim to produce um, a solid set of uh, summaries of the evidence as it exists. I think that really speaks, Julia, to some of the processes that Campbell has in place when they produce reviews. So one thing that I'm not sure has been touched on but speaks to Eamon's points about the back and forth and to the need to have rigor and reliability. Every Campbell review has a wide team of people who have expertise in the topic area, who have expertise in finding literature. So as Julia says, we don't just find the literature that's at the top of the pile, but a comprehensive summary of everything that's out there. And then people who have experience in systematic reviewing methods, and particularly in combining studies, primary studies together, and synthesizing them into an answer. And with all of that, we hope to provide a very reliable answer to all of the policy questions being posed to the collaboration. So after these questions, I was hoping that each of us could briefly address the next two. Uh, the first being, is there a magic bullet that can make a difference? I can start on that. I, I, I'm skeptical about that. I don't think there's any one thing that will solve and bring us from a state where policy and practice is essentially very little based on, on knowledge to a state where everything is. But there are things that can help improve the current situation. My candidate would be a legislative requirement to do the science rigorously and systematically before rolling out large-scale interventions with large costs uh, to the public and private exchequer. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, I'll take a slightly different tack on that. Um, my answer to the question is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just thinking about in terms of, we often look for magic bullets in terms of policies or practices that are supposed to fix or um, uh, remediate a particular condition, um, educational failure or a mental health problem. And in looking at the evidence on the effectiveness of treatment and social policies, I'm becoming more and more convinced that no single approach is going to work for everyone. So even the most effective treatment for a specific problem is not going to work for everyone, everywhere, all the time. There are really important um, contextual and cultural considerations here. So even when we're pretty convinced that a particular treatment um, has great promise, there may be cultures, um, populations for whom it is simply not appropriate or not feasible. Um, so that's a very interesting and important sort of caveat. And that understanding that context and culture matter has really begun to shape our work in important ways. Um, so now we're really dealing with the question what works best for whom under which conditions um, and I hope that will replace the more sort of simple question what works um, because even ineffective largely ineffective interventions might work under rare conditions so no magic bullets Thank you, Julia. That was much the point that I wanted to make, that uh, different programs can work differently in different settings and for different populations. And I think something I want to add to that point, um, and I think also addresses Eamon's point, in addition to this magic bullet issue and trying to get the evidence out there for people to use it, we also, I think as a society, need to increase our proficiency and competencies in appraising and utilizing evidence. So in addition to producing these reviews, I think it would be really helpful for people involved in the collaboration, people involved in policy, people involved in research and practice to emphasize the need to include evidence in key decisions for policy and practice and not just ideology. 
And the last question today is briefly saying why each of us got involved in the collaboration. So we might give ideas to those listening as to how they might be able to get involved. Well, I'd like to start this. Um, I became involved because I was aware of um, misinformation uh, that was sort of widely disseminated based on haphazard reviews of selected sets of studies on interventions. Um, so much of what I read in uh, scholarly journals um, in, is based on um, sort of a haphazard traditional narrative review of research. And I became aware that it's very easy to get it wrong um, using that method. And um, once I became acquainted with the approach of the Campbell collaboration, which is closely related to the approach of the Cochrane collaboration, I realized that review methods really do matter. Um, and we have studied differences in terms of the methods and conclusions of typical uh, haphazard narrative reviews and can show over and over again uh, the benefits of a more rigorous approach in terms of accuracy and quality of information. So if we want to improve policy and practice and improve human lives, I'm completely convinced that better information, better systematic reviews will help us get there. Yeah, thank you, I, Julia. Amen. Yeah, this is a challenging question, and I would say I, I come at this from a different background. I'm not a, a social researcher. Uh, my academic background is in history, and my professional background is largely in administration, in national bureaucracies and international uh, bureaucracies. So why am I involved in this? It's a combination of things, or it is the combination involved that attracts me. The ideals and idealism involved is uh, quite important in any community. And each of us at different times in our life will be vulnerable. And in any community, there are people who are vulnerable and who need assistance and who need some kind of uh, guidance and protection. And there are others who are likely to harm and also need to be uh, uh, cared for or dealt with in a certain way. And the society needs to uh, address this, address the needs of the community uh, in a way that minimizes problems and helps people to re realize their potential. So the ideal is very attractive. Then the dimension that gets me is that here, uh, as an operating, uh, on the operational side, I feel I can help operationalize these ideals and uh, produce things or help produce uh, reviews and other activities that can advance our knowledge and can help us and as societies to find better approaches. So it's a combination of lofty and ambitious ideals and the opportunity to work uh, on the matters of simply organizing and operationalizing these goals to deliver something that can help improve people's lives. That's, I think, why I'm here. Thank you, Eamon. In addition to those uh, principles that got uh, Julia and Eamon involved, my, I suppose, personal story is I got involved as a graduate student, uh, was doing a degree involved with developing, evaluating, and disseminating effective interventions for pressing social issues, and went to the Campbell Colloquia in DC in 2011 to present some research I was doing for my dissertation, and immediately enjoyed the network that was there, meeting both junior and senior researchers, policymakers, practitioners who are interested in effective solutions for social problems, and was immediately hooked after that. So, in addition to these aims of getting good evidence out there, I think those who are looking to have a conversation continually about how to solve pressing social problems, what are these problems we need to address, what are the most effective ways and efficient ways to get good evidence out there, Campbell is a great network to be involved in. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today and invite you to please be in touch. We have a general email that you can send messages to to find out information about the collaboration. But if you visit our website, you'll also see information for those involved in the different coordinating groups of the Campbell Collaboration, so education, social welfare, and so forth, if you have particular interest that you want to get involved in. We're also increasing our social media presence on Twitter and Facebook, so please find us there. 
And we really welcome all ideas and all people who are interested in getting involved in Campbell to get in touch with us. Learning how to produce reviews, producing reviews, getting evidence out to policy and practice. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you for your time. Thank you all very, very much.